commit all here. Welcome to the last of this season's virtual lecture series from Longfellow House Washington's Headquarters National Historic Site. On behalf of the Friends of Longfellow House Washington's Headquarters, I want to welcome you to the History of the Body in Art, Science, and Society events. Uh, we are very pleased to uh, provide the platform for these lectures and other lectures during the uh, course of the year as we all have to stay at home. And uh, we are hoping that uh, in the summer we will have uh, poetry readings and music at the house again, but if we don't, uh, the Friends of the Longfellow House will not only be ready to uh, sponsor those events, but we will be ready to sponsor online events instead. And we hope that in this season, uh, as you think of charities to give to, uh, that you would keep the Friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters on that list to provide the opportunity for more events like this to be available to the public for free. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn the screen over to uh, Supervisory Park Ranger, Emily Levine, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, John. Thank you to the uh, Friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters, um, truly for making this series um, and so many other events possible. Um, we look forward to lots more events with you in the future, hopefully hopefully in person. Um, and thanks once again to all of you for joining us. Um, I know many folks have joined us for um, this entire series, and some of folks are joining us for the first time this evening. Um, it's lovely to see you. Um, a couple of notes that many folks are familiar with at this point. Um, just a request to keep your mics muted for the duration of the talk this evening. We should have plenty of time at the end uh, for a Q&A session. So I will invite folks to put your questions in the chat uh, throughout the course of the talk this evening. We'll get to those at the end. Uh, or if you're feeling brave at the end, you're welcome to take yourself off mute and we'll have a little bit of a conversation. A uh, note as well that we are recording this evening. Uh, this recording will be available shortly on our YouTube channel. That does mean that if your camera is on during this program, you may uh, appear as a little square in that recording. So just be mindful of that. Um, a couple other logistical notes. I will be putting a link to our live captions in the chat shortly. Uh, everyone who received your registration email also had the link to the captioning in that email. So um, please feel free to utilize those live captions during the lecture um, brought to us by a real live captioner. So they should be much more accurate than the auto-generated captions you may be used to. All right, um, without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, this evening's talk is a really unique opportunity to connect some of the history of the site's collections at the Longfellow House to a much, much broader history. Um, we are truly lucky this evening to be joined by Dr. David Odo. Dr. Odo is the Director of Academic and Public Programs and the Division Head and Research Curator at the Harvard Art Museums. He is a visual and material anthropologist with primary research and teaching interests in the anthropology of art, especially early Japanese photography. Uh, Dr. Odo oversees the museum's academic and public engagement programs, including Harvard University course collaborations, student programs, and public education at the museums. Um, Odo received his Doctor of Philosophy in Social and Cultural Anthropology from the University of Oxford and has held numerous research fellowships, including at Harvard University, uh, the Freer and Sackler Galleries at the Smithsonian Institution, the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam, and the University of Tokyo. He has lectured and published widely on early Japanese photography and um, currently is working on a monograph about photography and history 
in Japan's Ogasawara Islands, which uh, examines photographs and other visual images related to the Japanese colonization of the islands and their cosmopolitan population from the 1930s until the present day. So some exciting current work. Um, prior to his current position, Odo was the Bradley Assistant Curator of Academic Affairs at the Yale University Art Gallery and lecturer in the Department of Anthropology there, uh, and previously worked in television in Honolulu and in Washington, DC. So um, I'm very pleased now to introduce Dr. David Odo. Thank you so much, Emily, and thanks to everyone at the Longfellow House uh, for inviting me this evening. And of course, thanks to all of you for uh, showing up. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Um, I'll try to try that one more time. There we go. How's that looking? Right. Looks good. We've got you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I should mention, um, I see a couple of my students there um, who will be used to the fact that I am not the world's best Zoomer. So uh, please bear with me. I'll do my best. Um, but I'm very excited to be with you this evening uh, and have a chance to speak to you tonight about uh, the body in early Japanese photography. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge, though, that I'm speaking to you uh, from the Harvard Art Museums at Harvard University, which, like the Longfellow House, is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. And I um, especially want to acknowledge that in light of the topic um, we're talking about today. This is, that is the idea of what photography can do to um, um, thinking of, and, and what we can think about when we think about photography and representations of bodies. And there's a long history of that with the indigenous people of this country as well. So without further ado, I'm going to get started. Um, first, um, I wanna uh, just say also that much of what I'll be discussing tonight um, comes out of research I conducted for my book, The Journey of the Big Type, which was published by the Peabody Museum Press. And the research for the book and support for the related exhibition were generously provided by the Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies at Harvard. And I'm also excited to be able to continue to build on this work as part of my contribution to an upcoming publication for the uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And I'll say just a tiny bit more about that later, but I wanted to acknowledge them for supporting kind of this phase of my work. So we're going to start this evening um, with some uh, photographs from the Longfellow House collection. And tonight I'm gonna to touch on three collectors um, who are actually um, Boston area American collector, collectors um, because the collectors, Western collectors of photographs of Japan were really the primary drivers in the creation of, um, well, these massive archives that we have of 19th century Japan in this country and really came to uh, constitute how foreigners viewed Japanese bodies in this early period. Photography, of course, was not the only way in which uh, Americans and other uh, non-Japanese came to see the people of Japan. But I think there is a, because of the special nature of the photograph that is with its authority to represent the real, um, it was of particular importance in the construction of ideas about Japanese people, and in fact, stereotypes of Japanese people. So first, as I said, I wanna to turn to photographs from the Longfellow House collection. The Longfellow House collection of photographs is a truly remarkable archive and has its beginnings in the Longfellow family's interest in the media. They were early adopters, if you will. And Charles, whom you see here in an 1872 portrait, was a world traveler who picked up the family affinity for photography. Charles Appleton Longfellow, often called Charlie, was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's eldest son and lived in Japan for nearly two years from 1871 to 1873. This portrait um, that you're looking at now was made by the Austrian photographer, the Baron Raymond von Stillfried. And we'll see many more uh, photographs by Stillfried a bit later in my talk. So Charlie is seen here wearing a formal Japanese attire consisting of a jacket or haori with five um, family crests uh, are called mon in Japanese. 
possibly incorporating his initial CAL. Uh, it might be a little bit easier to see there. Um, he also is wearing a divided skirt or trousers, a black tabi that you can see the toe is divided there, um, and straw sandals called zori. In his right hand, he's holding a fan, um, and his left side, he has a sword. I love um, the way that the art historian Christine Booth has characterized this as cultural cross-dressing. And it was a kind of a phenomenon at the time. A lot of Westerners going to Japan would have such photographs made of themselves. We're going to start um, looking at now photographs of Japanese subjects here. And this is from one of Charlie Longfellow's albums. And I'd love for you now to just take a guess um, and just throw into the chat, like, who do you think these photographs are of? And what I mean by that is you can see in some places names are written there, and we think in Charlie's own hand. Um, but what are the identities of these people? Who, what is their role? Who are they in some way? Do you have any, just looking at them, who, who do you think they might be? Any ideas? Ah, some might be geishas, some might be actors, courtesans, yeah. And yet, anything else? Aristocracy, great. Fabulous guesses. They are, in fact, um, meant to represent uh, geisha and actors, and absolutely. And, you know, it's amazing to me that this is probably from, um, these photographs were probably made in the 1870s, but the tropes, the ideas about what a geisha looks like are so strong and so embedded in our visual field that even all these uh, years later, we can still recognize um, who these uh, people are meant to represent. Now, what's interesting in particular about this collection from, from Longfellow is that it's very likely that these were, at least some of these people represented here were actual acquaintances. So people that, uh, Charlie actually knew. Um, so the term geisha, um, actually I should, I should mention here too, is very loosely applied and was and is very loosely applied um, outside of Japan. Um, probably um, most of the women here were, or at least many of them, were not actually geisha, which are a kind of a higher level skilled entertainers. Um, very easily conflated, however, with prostitutes in sort of the Western imaginary. And this is kind of where that beginning of fantasy elements really comes into play in this early representation of Japanese bodies, particularly of women. Um, there was an idea that um, the um, basically the sort of lack of distinction between uh, the uh, different levels of work um, so different kinds of sex work versus different kinds of entertainment. Um, and in fact, the, for foreigners in Japan at this time, there was a, um, a special category of prostitutes, in fact, regulated by the government. Um, there was a very derogatory term used for them. And so they weren't actually that sort of high level geisha as well. Um, so some of the pictures, we think some of the subjects in these early photographs that are sort of labeled as geisha or understood to be geisha might actually not in fact have been the case. But what's interesting about um, this uh, page from Charlie's album is that he's also included actors in here. And so I love this idea of performance being so explicitly acknowledged by the collector um, and that these kind of uh, carte de visite, these small uh, photographs pasted in, um, pasted onto this board sort of represent that performativity, this idea of uh, performing for the camera and perhaps performing for foreigners' eyes as well. Another thing I'll mention here is, um, try to advance, there we go. The um, photographs that we just looked, like, looked at are actually pasted on the reverse sides of these boards here. So this is Japanese uh, poetry calligraphy um, written on um, paper then, which is pasted on this gold flat um, album, accordion albums. And very interestingly, 
uh, Longfellow pasted his photographs on the other side, so made his own album. Yeah. Longfellow also collected a number of uh, loose photographs as well, or um, others that were sort of larger. And here you see an unidentified woman with a shamisen, also kind of generally falling into that category of kind of geisha-like pose and uh, accoutrement there. Um, but others, again, he um, probably knew. Um, for example, this woman named Ohana. Um, also, you see if you can um, see if I can get that there. Also, see, uh, it's titled alias Chocho, which is butterfly in Japanese. Ohana is flower, as you can see. Um, so the idea being that perhaps, um, you know, Charlie was collecting photographs of, um, again, uh, women that he interacted with in some way. Um, and what's also fascinating to see, um, and we'll talk about this a bit later, is that many of these photographs, um, whether or not he, in this case, actually commissioned them um, for his own use or they were available commercially, the, this blend or this uh, distinction between private and commercial photographs in this time uh, was very, very loose. And so some images that might have been made for personal consumption, whether for Charles Longfellow or other people, ended up being sold on the open market. The copyright protections were, were very, very weak. Um, so uh, anyway, that's just to get us started. But I wanted to also give you a little bit more background um, of photography at this time. Um, so just to take a little bit of a step back, um, in terms of what was going on historically as these, uh, as Charles Longfellow and others were collecting these photographs of uh, Japan and Japanese bodies, um, we see here some very important dates, like in 1867, uh, the Trans-Pacific Steamer Service finally began between San Francisco and Yokohama. So this took, you know, typically around 25 days, anyway, under a month for uh, uh, visitors to, travelers to get from uh, Yokohama to Japan. Um, and so at the time that was quite fast. Now we might consider it very slow, although since many of us are not moving anywhere, um, moving around very much, traveling very much now, it might seem again <laughs> fast, who knows. Um, but these various infrastructure changes that I've listed up here on the screen made it possible for um, foreigners to visit Japan for the first time and, and uh, widely for the first time during this uh, period called the Meiji period, which was around from 1868 to 1912, um, really was a period of un, a hitherto unprecedented contact between Japanese and Westerners. So although the country wasn't you know, entirely sealed off um, before this, the government, the shogunal government regulated travel to Japan so strictly that very few foreigners actually were allowed in the country. So over the course of several decades from the 1870s on, uh, forward, the Japan underwent a really radical transformation from a very militarily weak and mostly uh, geopolitically isolated country um, to a um, powerful modern nation with an infrastructure that was very purposefully engineered by government leaders to facilitate modernization. Um, and photography really was part and parcel of this process. And along with this opening up um, of uh, travel infrastructure and uh, modernization, um, many foreigners went to Japan, including from the Boston area, um, for things like honeymoons and just uh, around the world tours for travel. So um, what's interesting though, just at the same time, the travel writing um, just as Japan was very excited and invested in modernizing, the modern in Japan was routinely dismissed as tacky, coarse, imitative, and ugly by foreign travel writers. Um, so um, many, many um, writers uh, implored readers actually to visit Japan before it was quote unquote too late. And I think for um, those of us maybe who traveled a bit um, out during college or right after college, I remember hearing that very same sort of narrative myself about various countries in Southeast Asia or wherever it was. Like you better hurry up and go now before tourism ruins the culture forever. So this is an old trope 
um, but was applied to Japan in the 1870s, again, 60s and 70s, just as these photographs that we were looking at um, were taken. So on the one hand, many foreign observers sort of worried about the fading of this so-called samurai spirit and lamented Japan's cultural losses. On the other hand, they thought of it as a kind of Arcadia where, Arcadia where you know, this sort of uh, rural Italy kind of coexisted along with some strains of modernization. So it's a really interesting kind of dichotomy that was happening in uh, Western ideas about Japan. So this is an example of a lacquer album cover. So many photographs were kind of purchased in studios and placed um, either, they were already pre-assembled when clientele went into the studios to purchase and they could have, they might have uh, purchased an album that looked like something like this. Um, otherwise they could assemble photographs, uh, pages of photographs themselves and have them made into albums. Um, an interesting note is that already um, in this time period, in, in the last decades of the 19th century, these album covers were sometimes made in Canton. So they were already outsourcing the work um, and being imported back into Japan and sold as Japanese objects to foreigners. Colored photographs, and we'll be looking at those in just a few moments, um, were particularly favored by uh, foreign consumers. And this is an image of an, an idea of what it might have looked like for uh, the, hand, the hand coloring process. My guess here is that this is a very pretty version, um, obviously done in a studio uh, by the Japanese photographer, Kusukawa Kinbei, um, again, for foreign consumption, for tourist consumption. Um, probably the actual conditions of tinting photographs were not quite so, so beautiful. And finally, just uh, one last uh, quote I wanted to leave you with for the, um, from the, in terms of travel writing and, and tourism here. Um, this idea of photographs, I think, is really, really powerful, uh, both um, from a, this idea of figuring out what uh, you would want to see you know, before you go to Japan, also thinking about what is really sort of important to collect when you're in Japan. So the photographs really blended so well with the narratives of tourism. So I think um, this kind of blend of kind of documentary objectivity, that, that sense of authenticity that photographs were able to lend as well as the conforming really to the fantasies, the imaginary of the foreign visitors, um, I think was a, one of the reasons why uh, photographs were just so incredibly um, popular. Now I'm going to move on to um, uh, another uh, Boston uh, luminary. Uh, this is many of you will recognize in the portrait of Isabella Stewart Gardner. And I mentioned earlier that um, I'm you know, very honored to be working on um, an essay for an upcoming exhibition and uh, catalog project called Travel Respond Assemble, Isabella Stewart Gardner, which will um, be appearing in spring of 2023. So a little bit of time from now. Uh, this photograph is from 1888. Um, and again, my thanks to the Gardner Museum. Looks to be a fantastic exhibition and catalog, but it's given me the opportunity to take a look at some of Isabella's amazing um, travel albums. Um, she and her husband traveled to Japan and, um, in 1883, and this is one of the pages. And what's fascinating to me here is, um, uh, and actually, I'll, let me just quickly read to you the caption in case you can't see it. PL, I assume that's Percival Lowell, gave us a Japanese dinner at a tea house in Shinagawa, June 22. Um, so it's wonderful to have uh, you know, the collectors, the travelers um, own sort of annotations in these different pages of her albums, but these pasted in photographs really give a sense of what was being collected at the time um, and how Japanese bodies were being thought of or represented. And a lot of uh, Gardner's photo uh, collection here really focuses on um, work or uh, roles, occupations, those sorts of things. So um, 
in Charles Longfellow's case, he um, emphasized, um, I should say, first of all, all of the collectors you're meeting tonight will have also have collected landscapes and things like that. But in terms of the way people, human subjects were imaged, um, there was a bit of a kind of difference here. And in Isabella Seward Gardner's case, she seems to be very interested in images of uh, Japanese people more or less at work. So you might see, um, might notice here, for example, these uh, three women here possibly meant to represent you know, geisha, um, entertainers, certainly, right? Singing, um, dancing, that sort of thing. Um, the way, though, these photographs uh, look, as you will compare them in a, in a moment to some of the ones collected by another uh, Boston collector, um, really is more about the kind of labor being performed in a sense. Um, and I think that's also true in this next series of photographs again, and sort of almost sort of illustrating kind of the work that was being done. Here the, the um, caption reads, Tokyo, Tuesday, June 26, shopped all day and dined with WSB. So that's William Sturgis Bigelow, um, and we'll meet him in just another photograph or two. What I wanted to point out in this one here, it's a little bit difficult to see because this one, unusually for an image of a tattooed man is not colored. So it's difficult to make out the design of the tattoo there, but you can perhaps see a little bit of the tattoo impression there. Here is another um, page of photographs. Um, and this one is of um, images from the silk worm and silk industry. And what uh, kind of struck me, and again, I'm only very preliminarily um, sort of um, studying the, the travel album so far, but these photographs of Japan is that Gardner seemed to be very interested in um, photographs that related to kind of products in a sense, things that a were that were either being consumed by travelers or export goods. So things like silks that Westerners were very interested in purchasing from Japan. And so the, getting a sense through these photographs of the Japanese body at work, I think is really, really fascinating. Um, contrast between what Gardner was collecting and what others were collecting here. So let me move on to WSB that uh, we just met in, in uh, Isabella's travel album there. It's William Sturgis Bigelow seen here. He lived from 1850 to 1926. And he's known to many people um, in the Boston area because of his foundational gift of uh, Japanese and Chinese art to the MFA and really the foundation of their um, Asian art department. Um, but he, so and although he's known as an art collector and, and donor in the Boston area, he actually started out as a scientist with degrees from Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. He was a trained physician. He developed a passion, however, during for Japanese art during his five years studying medicine under Louis Pasteur in Paris in the 1870s. But the 1870s in Paris was also a time um, of Japanism, the craze for Japanese art and design. Um, and it was really at its height then. And so while he was in Paris, Bigelow met the famous uh, dealer in Japanese art, Siegfried Bing. And so when he finally returned to the United States in 1881, Bigelow um, returned with hundreds of Japanese art objects that he had collected in Europe. Um, and he exhibited these at the MFA. Um, so again, he was very foundational to the, the um, early art museum landscape in Boston, particularly for Japanese and other Asian art, art. So Bigelow lived in Japan for about seven years. He traveled extensively and actually eventually became a Buddhist priest. And when he died, he had his ashes divided between um, his temple in Japan in Kyoto and Mount Auburn Cemetery right here in Cambridge. So just a little bit of background on the, um, the collectors there. But what's interesting to me, again, just to give you a bit of a contrast between um, Bigelow's collection and Gardner's, as well as to uh, Charles Longfellow's here, um, he was, I'll just say just a few more words, he was a, a prolific collector of photographs, in addition to the other art objects that you know, he gave to the 
the MFA, his collection of photographs ended up some at the MFA, but also at Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, and that's the collection that I know best. It has many beautiful examples of full-size, exquisitely hand-tinted albumin prints. Um, and in contrast to the other two collections we briefly looked at, Bigelow's material, I would characterize, as much more luxurious and sumptuous. Um, but at the same time, they're sort of less personal, less intimate with, uh, with Gardner's travel albums. You, even though the photographs themselves were commercially purchased, you have a sense of her moving through time and space with Longfellow's photographs. Some of them you realize, you know, he probably had commission. They were maybe personal to him. The fact that he sort of hand captioned the names on them kind of hints at the, or suggests the ties, the personal connections that he had with Bigelow's photographs, um, as beautiful as they are, um, they really don't feel like they're representing um, his own kind of connections to people in particular. And so this image, for example, here from the 1870s falls very much in line with the kind of typical representation of Japanese women as geisha, quote unquote. Um, here, in fact, um, is a woman who's almost um, kind of nude on top. And many of the um, photographs along these lines actually do show women sort of half naked. Um, and these um, notably didn't end up in many female collectors' albums, but did end up in many male collectors' albums, unsurprisingly, perhaps. Um, but what's, what I find really interesting about this photograph, um, as pointed out by the art historian Eleanor Height, is um, the gold jewelry, or the jewelry that's colored gold here, a Western jewelry. Um, and Height has suggested that this might actually hint at a connection to a patron, a Western patron. Um, again, suggesting that the subject here is not a geisha, but rather a prostitute, perhaps. But in any case, we don't know that. There's no personalizing of this photograph in the collection. Um, rather, this is something that we know appears in many collections um, throughout the time period. Also, we know that, um, this, uh, that Bigelow was in Japan in the 1880s. This photograph again, made by Ryman von Stilfried, was likely produced in the 1870s. So it was a good 10 years plus later that Bigelow collected it. But these photographs were printed and reprinted over and over again throughout the decades. So again, hinting at a less kind of intimate or personal collection. Rather, he was collecting the photographs as objects. Bigelow also had some of these um, images, which again, um, you know, our best guess is uh, that the women pictured here were prostitutes rather than geisha or kind of everyday women. And I mentioned this again because um, one of the problems of this kind of fantasy representation of Japanese women was that in um, many kind of Western accounts, um, this idea basically of Japanese womanhood, of Japanese femininity was completely tied in with prostitution. Um, so you can imagine how kind of you know, problematic that is when um, a whole gender and uh, conflating, you know, uh, you know, cultural norms with prostitution um, was um, really one of the kind of negative side effects, both of tourism and travel, but also of photography, because it seems to represent that again some kind of a truth there. Just a few more um, images I wanted to leave you with here. Um, the, this is, again, um, a wonderful caption that in the album, um, one of uh, Nicolo's albums called The Singing Girl, a good type. And one of the things I love about this captioning is that singing girl was uh, an English language euphemism for geisha. So apparently, was euphemistic enough not to have any kind of hint of uh, prostitution or you know, sexual transactions in the name, but yet just salacious enough that it was uh, desirable to have there. So this is an image that, again, um, we don't necessarily think that this subject was originally um, an actual geisha, perhaps, again, more along the lines of a prostitute, but in any case, um, fulfilled the role the fantasy role of Asia in many photo albums. <laughs>
this was, you might remember the first image I showed from the cover of the book. And uh, this really, to me, uh, uh, kind of indicates a sort of European sentimental romanticism that was used to shape a composition and posing for many uh, photographs um, that sold extremely well of Japanese women in the 1870s and 80s. Um, and, but I do want to also leave some time to talk about some of the male photographs. And one of my favorites is this of a man in samurai armor it's beautifully, beautifully hemmed, colored, a half-length, half-length image. And I sort of hinted at earlier that samurai as a construct was much admired or feared, depending on the context, in the sort of minds of many Westerners. And the scene, the samurai was seen as the embodiment of a native Japanese spirit um, grounded in the recent feudal past of Japan. Um, but there was a wide range of associations in the Western uh, imaginary. Um, for our purposes here, though, I think photographs such as this, I think for the most part, were produced and circulated after the Meiji Emperor had stripped the warrior class of certain privileges in 1871. So, for example, at that time, the samurai were required to cut off their top knots. So, um, this, this top knot that you see here would actually no longer have been legally allowed at the time this photograph was made. And I think if you look kind of closely, um, perhaps you might, like I do, think that this is possibly a wig rather than the man's actual hairstyle. However, this um, photograph is, has a, had a long life. Um, so both back um, in the 1870s and later into the 19th century was heavily collected by Westerners. But even in as recently as 2018, you can see I'm showing you an album cover from the Manic Street Preachers who took uh, the same photograph, uh, obviously retouched the color a bit, but this kind of representation of the Japanese body sort of from the Meiji period making its way into the 21st century, I think is really quite fascinating. So. Um, you might want to take a look at that at some point. A few more images to show you before we'll open it up to questions, but this um, also is, again, harkens back a little bit to Isabella Stewart Gardner's travel album, where um, this idea of occupation or labor becomes very important and Japanese bodies performing work. And you can see here um, certain of these two men are more or less interchangeable um, it's just sort of illustrating a kind of work. But my favorite thing to, to uh, really think about in terms of uh, how the body appears in early Japanese photography is this very popular um, use of tattooed men. Um, and tattoos, I should say, were used in Japan for centuries to mark lower class occupations, criminality, and even sort of outcast status. So. Uh, much like the samurai image we saw just a moment ago, um, by 1872, the government had outlawed tattooing for Japanese citizens. And so, although foreigners were still allowed to get them, um, you know, actually by the time um, this photograph was made, it's unlikely that um, the subject was actually tattooed. And the reason I'm showing you two seemingly identical photographs here is that I actually encountered these in the archives, one on top of the other. So I was, as I was flipping through them, I was able to notice that the design is in fact a little bit different. So if you take a look closely here, you can see that the designs are not exactly the same. There's, there's some subtle and not so subtle differences. Um, you can see here this on the left but buttocks there, and this one is different here. The, the headscarf also has a slightly different design. There's an area here on the right arm that looks, is colored differently, but the basic design looks to be identical. That suggests perhaps there was um, um, uh, some basis of a tattoo there on the original body. It's not clear, um, but this is really fascinating to me that um, despite the fact that perhaps the photographers are no longer able to get uh, certainly younger men with these actual tattoos on their bodies, the demand was such that um, 
the uh, photo studios produced basically fake tattoo photographs. And finally, I want to leave you um, with another photograph of Charlie Longfellow um, himself. So as I mentioned, foreigners, it's a bit ironic, but by the time he got there, foreigners, uh, Japanese subjects were not, Japanese were not allowed to tattoo their bodies legally. I'm sure many still did. Um, but foreigners were, in fact, allowed to. So there's, you know, a number of Boston Brahmins and European aristocrats who would go to Japan and get these tattoos. And you can see here that uh, Charlie certainly went all out with his, his Japanese tattoos there. Um, of course, um, you know, the tattoos were also very popular with uh, sailors and, and others. So it wasn't, um, strictly speaking, an upper class uh, pastime. But anyway, I... Um, would want to leave it there and make sure that I have I leave some time for uh, for um, questions. Thank you so much, and um, I've got a couple of questions that have come in already in the chat. Um, so, folks, do feel free to continue putting questions in there. We've got just over fifteen minutes for some conversation. Um, I do have a, let's see, I've got a question. Um, um, so I have a question from, um, from our archives and, um, our <laughs> archives intern was really curious about the, um, the coloration. And so yeah. Evgenia was, um, asking about uh, I was curious to know if this was a trend in photography demanded by um, European and American uh, photography collectors and travelers, sort of how that um, trend of colorizing the photos came about. Yeah, so it's a great question because it was, um, of course, this is before there was, you know, color film, right? So the, the uh, photographs were not sort of naturally colored, right? And it was a, an intervention that took place physically um, um, on the photograph, and the um, it was actually not just sort of limited to Japan. It was popular all over the world, um, Europe and other parts of Asia, etc. But the difference with the Japanese technique was that um, was watercolor and sort of other natural pigments, mainly natural pigments, not exclusively in Europe and North America and other places around the world. Often, oil paint was used, so it produced a very different effect. Um, so there was a kind of general global popularity um, with colored images, colored photographs, but in Japan in particular, because of the use of watercolor and other natural pigments and, and natural pigments, it was particularly collectible. So colored photographs were extremely, extremely um, desirable in the Japanese uh, context. Thank you. Um, and I have a question from Amanda. Um, and this came in while you were speaking. Amanda was curious, were the carte de visite used among um, the Japanese themselves? Uh, that is a great question. I didn't have time to kind of fit in that side of the story. In fact, um, you know, Japanese uh, consumers also purchased photographs in large quantity, of course, later than um, sort of wealthy foreigners going into to Japan and collecting them as souvenirs. But indeed, they did uh, collect um, uh, carte de visite and other photographs as well. So I would call that a kind of parallel photographic practice that was happening in Japan at the same time, simultaneous to this foreign um, sort of souvenir market. Um, so if you look in Japanese archives and Japanese museums and, and library archives, you'll find, um, as well as you know, family collections, you'll find an enormous number of card to visit and other photo cabinet cards, all sorts of other uh, photographs um, being collected at the same time. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Amanda, for that question. Um, Sam asks, were the concepts of a geisha and samurai popularized in Western society through this distribution of photographs in the late 19th century, or was there interest prior to this era of tourism? It's a sort of a yes and, um, you know, it's really what I would call mutually constitutive kind of um, fantasy or stereotype, right? So 
there were many um, ways in which uh, foreign audiences became interested in stories about Asian samurai. Um, so it was through travel writing, it was through other fo visual forms as well. But photography, I would argue, is just one of the most important, most central, because it gave that kind of reality effect. Um, and even in, if you look at uh, writing, for example, you would have um, illustrations, sometimes line drawings, but absolutely, um, when it was possible, um, there were tipped in photographs. And so photographs were considered very important, I think, in um, kind of stoking the fuel, the fires for uh, this interest in Samurai and Geisha. Thank you, and Sam says, <laughs> thank you as well. You're answer. very welcome. Um, here, well, here's a question from our very own John Bell. Um, John Bell is curious. Uh, he said, we've seen photos with fake tattoos and probably um, the fake top knot on Japanese men. Were there equivalent forbidden and recreated traits for women? Uh, so not in the same way that I'm aware of. What I would say the kind of the, the faking that was going on really had more to do with kind of positionality. So for example, as I mentioned, um, this idea of geisha and like different, different levels of uh, kind of skill and, and status within the entertainment world versus courtesan or sex worker or pro prostitute, those sorts of things. Um, that's, there seems to be quite a lot of fakery <laughs> going on in, in photography there. So, um, perhaps it extended to things like uh, the particular kind of kimono, how those were worn, uh, the hairstyles, things like that. Um, and we know that probably in early uh, photographs, the many of the women pictured were probably initially from photographers' own household or their immediate area. Um, so not actually whatever they were purporting to represent, uh, whether it was geisha or something else. Another possibility is um, early photographers would pay kind of poor women to pose, right? And then we think um, prostitutes were also recruited. It was not a kind of respectable job, right? So modeling for uh, the camera was not considered um, uh, good employment. So our, in, in terms of that sense of authenticity, in terms of what viewers were maybe projecting onto it, there's, there's a definite mismatch between what was probably happening in the photographer's studio versus what people were expecting to see. Okay, thank you for addressing that. Um, folks, feel free to keep questions coming. If anyone is feeling brave and would like to just come off mute and chat, uh, please feel free to ask your question that way as well. A um, new question just came into the chat. Those photos presented here seem um, that they were all taken by Western travelers rather than Japanese photographers? Is that, is that right? That's a great observation. It's actually not the case, though. So uh, the earliest photographers in Japan were Western photographers. So some of the photos I showed you at the end by the Austrian photographer, uh, von Stilfri, um, he was one of the earliest photographers in the country, and there are a few others who were earlier. Um, but right um, around that same time, right around in the 1860s and 70s, and then it, um, you start to find a lot of Japanese photographers setting up shop. By the end of the 19th century, it was essentially 100%, nearly 100% Japanese photographers. So all the Western, and um, there were a few Chinese uh, commercial photographers who were successful as well. Essentially, all of the foreign photographers were gone, more or less, by the, by the um, turn of the century. So um, the answer is basically the, I would say that most of the Japanese photographers who kind of took over the souvenir photography business reproduced the same kind of images that the market demanded. So they were actually um, creating uh, sort of a stereotypical market demanded um, images. So they would not have been purchased by Many of them would not have been purchased by Japanese consumers, but Western and other foreign consumers were interested in those. Great, and thank you for the question. Um, great question here in the chat. Most of the photos are posed or otherwise stylized. 
Was this because of exposure times or were there more candid photos taken? Uh, that's a really great question too. And I always forget to mention this, um, but by the time these photographs were taken, actually this, the exposure time was very, very brief, like less than a second. So the very earliest uh, photographic processes required a longer, you know, um, required the subjects to pose for a much longer period of time. Um, but by the time these were made, um, actually, that wasn't really an issue. Um, so the, um, the more difficult question would be lighting, so sources of artificial light, um, whether or not, um, you know, the, the studio was, you know, had sufficient natural light coming in through the windows, that sort of thing. Those are the, those are the elements that kind of had more of a, an impact on um, the, the photographer's craft. I'm not sure if I did answer the question. <laughs> okay. Yes, and if uh, Alan has any follow-up questions, feel free to feel free to just come off mute. Um, a question from uh, Diana um, wrote: In Japan, were tintypes popular? Um, what about painted tintypes? So popular in the northeastern. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, quite hear the, the end of that, Emily. Oh, that um, she said they're, they're, because they were very popular um, in this part of the United States, it sounds like. Oh, right, okay. Um, no, in fact, not as popular in Japan. Um, so I would say daguerreotypes, and for the earlier stages, you know, daguerreotypes were um, very important, and then um, from the 1870s on, these sort of albumin prints really, really took over uh, the market. Um, so um, and I actually don't, I'm not, I don't have a good explanation for why that would have been the case, but yeah, not as popular as it were in the United States. All right, I think we have time for one or two more questions if anyone is still curious about anything. Um, once again, just an invitation to pop in the chat or to uh, come off mute. Um, so here's a question specific to the Longfellow collection. Um, Jim asks, can you speak about the photo collection at Longfellow and some of the difference uh, between that and other collections? Yeah, um, I wish I knew a little bit more about the Longfellow collection. Um, I looked at it briefly. It, um, what I'll say is that um, it does feel to me, at least at this initial stage, to be incredibly personal. So uh, because uh, Longfellow was there for you know relatively long period of time, he wasn't um, sort of just passing through. It seems like he collected uh, photographs of things that he was intimately involved with, in or with, I should say. Um, I can't remember, I don't think I showed a picture. There's a wonderful picture of the house that he rented um, at Tsukiji um, outside of Tokyo. Um, and you, you know, one gets the sense of uh, both with the other kinds of Japanese objects he collected and the photographs, um, that it was really about his kind of life there. With a uh, gardener's album, I would say it really reads like exactly what it was, a travel, almost like a travel diary, right? So yes, connected, she was probably in those places doing those things and her annotations kind of enliven that, but it's not the same thing as sort of someone who was living in the space for a long time. And then the third collection um, is ironically the least personal feeling to me that um, um, it, was, it was as if Bigelow really was buying objects, right? He was collecting photographs as opposed to using them as a way to kind of like an eight memoir of his trip or any, his time in Japan. So it really seems a bit more separate from his life than uh, Longfellow's or even that Gardner's. Thank you. And if folks are interested in um, learning and seeing more of Charlie Longfellow's travels, um, we have a new virtual exhibit that was uh, put together this fall, and I'll just drop a link 
We have time for one more question. Um, oh, we have two more questions in here. All right, I have a, <laughs> let's see, did you, um, All right, um, from Alan, who were the publishers or producers or compilers of those albums with the lacquered covers? Uh, so the, the, there, were, there was a very large number of uh, studios um, in Japan um, at the height, so these last few decades of the 19th century. Um, so there are many very entrepreneurial uh, studios that, um, um, where the photographs um, were kind of, the photographers produced them, they colored them, they sold them. Um, so these were um, very, very successful businesses for a number of years. They were also exported to um, the United States and other foreign countries. So those were published then by you know, American or European um, publishers. Um, so they were really they had a global market. And a, um, a, a shout out from Jim too in the chat to um, Christine Guth's book, uh, Longfellow's Tattoos. And so Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mentioned <laughs> I, I mentioned her at the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mentioned her at the beginning of my talk. She's a fantastic scholar, and um, yeah, I I, uh, I love that. Yeah, that's it's really a great book. I highly recommend it. <laughs> great, and John's got a link link to that in the chat as well. Wonderful. All right. So we are nearly at the top of the hour. Um, once again, thank you so much, um, Dr. David Odo. Thank you um, to all of you who joined us this evening to conclude our 2021 virtual fall lecture series. Um, it's really been a pleasure thinking through some of the complexities of this history, this art in conversation with our collections. Um, and we hope that we see all of you again soon, both online and in person. I would like to invite folks to join us uh, on site outside, it's gonna be chilly, um, on Saturday, December 11th, as uh, we kick off our Let Hope Ring holiday poetry stroll around Harvard Square that will be in partnership with Mass Poetry, uh, the Friends of the Longfellow House and the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy. Um, and I'll pop a little uh, link to that in the chat as well. For folks who are already asking, uh, we have been recording this evening. And um, if you'd like to catch up on anything that you might've missed, this lecture will be posted on our YouTube channel shortly. I will send out a link um, to everybody who registered to that if you'd like to relive it. So um, lots of appreciation in the chat. Thank you so much once again for this wonderful talk. Thank you to the Friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters for helping to make this series possible. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and thank you again. Take care. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Good night.